Let's put our living stereo stylus in this groove. Welcome to BDI's Empower webinar series, and thank you for joining us. By the way, before we get started, there is a download available for you to follow along during today's webinar and to refer to afterward. We're putting it in the chat, or it might already be there. I think it's in the chat already to the right of your screen. 
So be sure to grab that as we get going. Alrighty, well, today we are thrilled to feature Tom Scott. Tom never intended to work for a ministry and he wasn't sure his 30 year for-profit career working in both B2B and B2C marketing arenas would translate well for a gospel rescue mission. Nevertheless, during his four years with Water Street Mission in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Tom helped move the needle, not only on year over year overall revenue and ROI, but also on softer metrics like community goodwill, tons of earned media, sponsorships, and social media engagement. Today, as a full-time professor of marketing communication at Lancaster Bible College, Tom is dedicated to having kingdom impact through the students he trains while continuing to serve for-profit and nonprofit organizations as a consultant. Tom is an author, he's a professor, and an award-winning marketer, and we welcome him today. Hey, Tom, I will let you jump right in here and get going. Thanks so much, Lolly. I am so excited to be here. Um, one thing I realized when I shifted from being in the for-profit world to nonprofit marketing is actually how much more complex nonprofit marketing is. I mean, after all, you're selling value to donors and volunteers, and yet you deliver services to a third party. That is so much more complicated than just a value for value exchange where you either like the car I've got at the price I've got or you don't. It's so much more complicated. So know first and foremost that I understand where you're at and I understand that you've got a challenge. And on top of that, you're doing it with probably much less budget and many less hands to help in, in a nonprofit atmosphere. So, uh, so let's start with that. Now, know that I teach this as part of a 15-week course, and this, I think, takes up four to six weeks of that. So there's an awful lot of stuff that I'm going to try and condense down. Because of that, I want to make sure that we're focusing on goals that we can actually accomplish today. The first and foremost is imparting the right mindset and principles. Um, because if you've got a, a, a different way of looking things, your paradigm's been shifted and you've got the principles uh, to work from, you're able to move forward and make decisions based on that without necessarily knowing all the little techniques along the way. Those things you can grow in if you've got the right mindset and principles. So that's first and foremost what I wanna do. Second, I wanna provide a framework uh, for the basic process and guiding techniques uh, that you can use in order to implement some of these ideas. I want to give you some, some application ideas on how this actually works uh, in, in a typical uh, mission atmosphere. And then, of course, I want to answer questions. So a couple ground rules. First, I tend to speak fast. If you have any questions, just make sure to put them in the chat box along the way, and we'll, we'll get to them in the end. Additionally, uh, I did provide a sheet uh, that has kind of an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. The reason why I do that is because I don't want you so focused on capturing my every word. I'd rather you stick with the full thoughts. So I'm going to challenge you at the end of today. The reality is you are not going to be able to do all of this from the get-go. You are not going to be able to grasp even probably all of this from the get-go. So I'm going to challenge you. Pick the one, two, or three things uh, at the end of the call when you're all done, you've had your questions answered, Pick that one, two, or three things that you are going to actually work on applying in your mission. That having been said, let's start with some principles. First, I want to address the idea of why community engagement is really so important. First and foremost, it because, it's because it leverages absolutely everything you do. Uh, whether it's trying to, to get someone to volunteer for your organization, or whether it's, you know, you've got this wonderful partnership with, with Brewer Direct. I love them, uh, and they do a fantastic job in that realm. But they'll be the first to tell you that if you've got great community goodwill, if you've done a great job at making sure people in your area know what you do, are excited about you, about what you do, and love you as an organization, the rates of return on that investment that you make with Brewer is going to be better. Uh, so it really does leverage everything you do. Uh, it builds on itself and it grows organically. When you get to a certain point, you've probably heard before the idea of a tipping point. Uh, when something gets popular enough at some point, then it starts to take off. That's what happens when you start to get people excited in your community about you and what you do and the people you serve. Um, also, 
there's no neutral in life. You can't just coast. The reality is you're either expanding or you're contracting. And so making sure that you're constantly doing something all the time uh, to uh, engage your community, to get people excited about what you do, keeps you on that trajectory of growing. That having been said, let's talk about some basic uh, principles that that we need to build on. And the reason why I always start things from a principle base, it's really, it's not an academic background because I'm not a typical academic. Uh, it's because when you have principles, they kind of serve as your pillars. Uh, they serve as those things that become immutable for what you do. And it helps you make decisions as you move forward on actual tactics. Uh, there are lots of incredible, like awesome new digital marketing tactics that are out there right now. Uh, some of them fit very well with the principles that we're talking about. Some might not. By, by having a principle based, and that's something only you and your organization can decide what your principles for this are, um, it helps you know what are those things we engage with and what are those things we don't. What are those new techniques and, and strategies that we can use in our marketing and what won't we? Um, and that just, it, it helps that whole thing. So these are my principles that I've come to when it comes to the whole realm of fundraising and community development. First and foremost, God doesn't need your help. I hate to say it, he doesn't. Reality is that he could do all this without us and it's not about the stuff, it's not about the things, it's not about the money, it's not about the, the uh, getting exposure in a newspaper, it's about people, it's about relationship and it's about hearts. He uses all these things we do, uh, the, the, the work we employ in, the, the marketing that we do, the cultivation we do of, of our audience. He uses those things to put us in relationship with others. That's the prime purpose. Uh, and so that is a principle that I build things on. As an example, I know that when I, when I became a father, it changed the way I, I saw God completely. And I remember distinctly, it was a time when my oldest son at that point was like three years old. And I was going out to wash the car. He so desperately wanted to help. I brought him along. Here's the reality. It, it probably took me three times as long to wash the car with that beautiful, wonderful little boy of mine. And the car probably wasn't as clean in the end. But wow, it made his day and it was a point of connection. The reason why knowing that God doesn't need our help in this is so important is because it should release you. It should give you a, a much uh, lighter view of being able to do your part in something, to, uh, to be responsible, of course, to the, to the mission and what you do, but not feel the weight of it on your shoulders because in the end, you are not responsible for the outcome. You're responsible for your part in it. So that's the very first principle. Second, community building around a kingdom mission is in and of itself a ministry of discipleship. The reality is that too often we treat donors like walking pocketbooks uh, or wallets. We treat volunteers as just another person to throw at, at a project uh, to help us. And it's so much about us that we forget that in this process, because if we, once again, have that first principle of, of it's a partnership with God and it's about relationship, if we've got that idea, then we have an elevated responsibility and thought that, wow, you have the opportunity as uh, someone that works in a mission of helping others find the joy in giving, whether that giving is of their influence, whether that giving is of their time or efforts, or whether that giving is of their money. You are helping people in a discipleship way of getting them to connect with the part that they are playing in the kingdom by investing in your organization with the people that you serve. Uh, third, people do not sustainably do what they ought to do. They do what they want to do. And if you don't believe that, then you've probably never made a New Year's resolution in your life. The reality is we all know we should eat better, we should go to the gym more often, uh, we should call uh, our Aunt Martha or someone else that we haven't called for a while. We know we ought to do these things. We don't all the time. And we don't because we don't want to. When something changes from a want 
to a uh, to some from an ought to a want, that's when we take action. That's really important to recognize when we're dealing with the public because the public all has their reasons for doing things. Uh, whether that is a donor who gives because really they are just trying to appease themselves of guilt, whether that's a donor who gives because they want to see the community change, or whether that's a donor that gives because they read a specific story about Jeff who has a, a, an addictions challenge and they want to see that addictions program uh, be be better funded so that other people like Jeff don't walk down that same road. No matter what, they all have their reasons. But too often, when we approach people as an organization, we've got our mission and why we do things. And we project that on others as if others should do it for the same reason or that they should do it just because it's the right thing to do. They don't. It's important to remember that. Um, OK, people don't do things for our reasons. They do them for theirs. So once again, that ties right in to doing what they ought to do uh, versus what they want to do. It's about their own personal reasons. People don't remember what we say as much as how we make them feel. Uh, and this plays out in all sorts of ways in, in, uh, in getting an audience together. Some of it is when you talk to the audience in your messaging, are you uplifting? Are you inspiring? Are you helping them feel like they're part of something great? Uh, or are you talking at them? Are you preaching to them? Are you doing things that make them feel like they ought to feel guilty for not being homeless themselves? Uh, there are different ways we can make people feel. Also, we can make people feel like they're part of something great and big and wonderful just by how we host events. Um, by how we uh, conduct calls, by how we put out letters, by, by doing things that engage them emotionally and we uplift and encourage them. And once again, remembering this is discipleship, that we are helping them become their own best selves as they're helping us. That's an awesome thing. And people like that type of, people like to feel that way. And you know, you know those friends you have in your life that, uh, you know, there are friends that you like and you, you, you love them and you'll, you'll hang with them when it's time to hang with them. But sometimes with certain friends, it's like by the end of the time, it's like, that was awesome and I'm done for a little while. Uh, there are other friends that the second you don't feel great about something, maybe something went bad, you call them because they always make you feel good. That's the type of person an organization you need to be for your community. You need to be that group, that group, that that organization that people feel good by being a part of you or by being alongside you. Um, we all have a deep desire for purpose, even in the use of our resources. Uh, it, no one builds a business just for the sake of building a business. They always have some greater idea in mind. Some lower level ideas of that are things like just providing. Yes, it's really great to have a house. It's great to have cars. It's great to have food. It's great to have a wife and kids and be able to send those kids to college, all those types of things. But no one does those things specifically for those reasons. It's, it's the deeper purpose. And that's the beauty of being in the, the rescue mission business and having Christ uh, and the kingdom as the core of what we do because that is the ultimate purpose and helping people recognize that their involvement with you is helping them fulfill their purpose. That once again becomes a powerful motivator. Uh, next, it's not about, it's about the network. It's not about every individual. Now this is kind of contradictory because on one hand I'm saying you want to treat everybody as individuals. On the other hand, uh, you want to uh, you want to make sure that you recognize that it's not just about the individual you're talking to. So here that here's how this plays out. Typically, like this happens all the time, whether it's networking events, whether it's just uh, talking to individuals, is we are so sold on what we do that we, when we talk to someone, uh, whether it's online, whether it's offline, we are pushing our agenda. We're expecting that they are going to say yes or no to what we want. Um, the challenge with that is that doesn't recognize the fact that the person I'm talking with may not be like the one for me. 
but guess what? Everyone knows like 250 to 300 people and they may not be perfect for my organization because maybe they like, the fact is not everybody even has the same heart desire for giving. Some people love giving to, to missions and local stuff. Uh, others like to give to Hope International or some overseas mission. We're all wired differently and God made that wonderfully so. But wouldn't you like to have an opportunity if the person you're talking with isn't like fully on board with, with local missions, wouldn't you want them to say, you know, but there are like three or four people I know that would just love this because they're always talking about doing inner city stuff. That's the type of relationships you want to build with people that they don't feel like if they're not the perfect person for you at that moment, that, okay, you're on to the next. You want them feeling like they are valuable and you still want to encourage them, uplift them, inspire them, knowing that they have a full network of people that they could introduce you to. And so definitely that is incredibly important. This gives me, gives you what, what I call posture. Posture is that idea that you, you are talking to other people about what you do, but you don't need them too much. Uh, think of it like even from yourself when you go to buy something. Let's say you're going into a, a, a car dealership or something like that. Those people that come up to you and are like really, really, really pushing and they give you that feeling like they just need me like too much here. In that situation, you don't feel as comfortable with them. You feel comfortable with someone who's very secure in what they do. Like I am, I am part of this mission. We do this awesome stuff and we'd love to have you aboard but it doesn't have that feeling of what we need you like, because once again, if God's doing this, then we don't need everybody. We're inviting them. Um, next, uh, people act in accordance with who they believe themselves to be. This is so super important. I learned this lesson from a, a pastor I had early on uh, in, in marriage. And he used to get up at the end of, every message on Sunday morning and say, you know, I am just so privileged because I pastor the greatest flock that anyone possibly could. And he said this week after week, and he would always say how, how wonderful his congregation was. And I talked to him once afterwards because I was friends with him. I said, Dan, you know, I love what you say, but I know some of these people and some of them are like total bozos. And he's like, no, there's the thing. You gotta talk to people as you know they truly are. And the fact is, if we're Christians, we know that there is this wonderful redeemed person inside of whoever it is we're talking about. And that level of redemption, we may see or we may not see in that moment. But when you are talking to people, the more you let them know how much of a help they are and how great it is that I'm part of a community that gives. Uh, I We're just so privileged that we've got a community of business people who come alongside us and help where they can. I, we're, we're privileged to be part of a community where the churches don't uh, work in competition with each other, but they work together and they oftentimes come on board as a group to help us at Water Street Mission. When you speak that way, and you're doing it consistently, you're not complaining about what you're not getting from the community, you're not complaining about who's not helping you, but instead you're constantly calling out and, and highlighting those people who are doing those things. I mean, it's awesome, we do that on social media all the time, calling out those who do those things and talking to the community that way, you will be absolutely shocked. If you do that for six months to a year, you'll be shocked how much it becomes exactly what you said it was. And I'm not talking about a name it and claim it, blab it and grab it type of doctrine. I'm just saying an encouragement doctrine, an inspiration doctrine, and telling people who they really are will bring it out of them. Um, next, pattern interrupts are vital for standing out. Um, it's important to be unexpected in certain situations. Uh, I know at Water Street, one of the things we would do is uh, we would have meetings for some of our top level donors, where it was more of a, a small meeting. There was typically like 20 to 25 people there. And we would tell people when they were invited, leave your checkbook at home. We're not taking any money there. Um, that's a, an immediate pattern interrupt because we're telling them, first of all, 
okay, they're not being hit up for anything at this particular time. Um, and it's, it's, they're not used to hearing an organization say, we're not doing this, uh, we're not taking your money. We've also had some large free events where it was just a worship night, where it wasn't about people donating to the organization, it was just to get everybody you know, from the community together. Uh, so doing things that are different, uh, using language that's a little different at times, uh, is a pattern interrupt that it's anything that, that keeps your mind from going down that same path it typically does uh, in, in thinking that they're going to be sold. Because here's the, the wonderful thing is, like, if you're talking about the for-profit world, I always say that uh, people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. Well, in the nonprofit world, it's the same way. People love to give, people love to help, people love to serve, but they don't want to be pushed, they don't want to be guilted. And so... Uh, using those pattern interrupts that gets past that automatic resistance uh, is really important. Uh, next, influencing and leading will always win over manipulating in the long term. Here's the reality. Once you learn how to market, uh, you learn uh, copywriting and language and messaging, you are equipped with a very, very powerful skill. That skill can be used to influence or manipulate. That's reality. And in fact, I've done tests before where if I put together a message for whether it's a online promo or a direct mail piece, if I use manipulative guilt-based language, I can probably get, for the most part, a higher return the first time. The challenge with that long term is at some point, you stop opening the mail because if someone's going to make you feel bad every time you open up the mail, you're not going to do it. Um, and that's one of the things I absolutely love about Brewer. They have got such awesome hearts about what they do uh, that the language they use, everything they're saying it is discipleship based. It is inspirational. It is loving. And on top of that, they are better than anyone I've seen out there as far as being able to take on your voice as an organization to be able to put that forward uh, so that they, they really do write great stuff from the get-go with your voice. That to me is just incredible. So not, not to go out as an aside for Brewer, I'm not being paid to be on here, but you know, uh, I just, I do love them so much as far as that goes. Um, but think of it this way, think of, you know, a parent, who they've got an adult child who's no longer living with them and and the mom or dad calls and pretty much guilts the child out because they're not visiting enough can you get a visit out of that sure i can guarantee you a the visit itself won't be as as wonderful or, or pleasurable for either because one party is going to feel like they were guilted into it and the other party is going to feel like the only reason they're there is because i manipulated them uh, and then on top of that what does that do for the long-term relationship? And that's all of this, what this is about, it's building long-term relationships with people in your community. That's really what you're doing here. It's not rocket science. It is not something that's difficult to do, but it takes intentionality, much like relationships in your home. Um, so that having been said, let's talk about some guiding techniques uh, that apply some of these principles. First, it starts with your organization and yourself. The reality is I am shocked when I hear people talk about how no one shares or likes their stuff online. No one says anything about them. Well, in order for people to remark about you, you need to be remarkable. Sorry. So, you know, in the for-profit world, I always said that nothing kills a bad product faster than good advertising. So the reality is you yourself have to be have to be doing great stuff in your organization. And the fact is you probably are, but you might not be referring to it in such a way that people know how great it really is. On top of that, you yourself have to be excited about what you do. Uh, the, the people that you have right for you, the people that do social media for you, they should be excited about what you do. No one is gonna be more excited about what you do than you are. So. If, you, if you're not excited and you're starting here, they're going to be less excited. That's just the reality of the situation. I remember when, uh, when I was first married, we were living in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and 
Uh, we had, you know, everybody's had, had this type of thing where you've got kids coming to your door selling stuff during certain seasons for school. And of course, I get the kids that would come with the, the candy bars and stuff like that. They timidly knock at the door, they come, say, you wouldn't want to buy a candy bar, would you? Well, sometimes I did just because it was so pathetic. But the reality is they didn't make me excited about buying a candy bar. They didn't make me feel good about buying a candy bar. And, and if I was a different type of person, I might not answer the door the next time. But there was this one kid, amazing, couldn't have been more than eight years old. And he knocks on my door first, you know, nice big knock. Open the door. Hi, Mr. Scott. You look like someone who'd love some Christmas wrap for your family for this Christmas. And that it started there and it just went past that. He was excited from the get-go. He was clear about what he wanted, all of that. It has to start with you and your organization. That you've got to be excited about what you do and you're presenting opportunity to people. Um, communicate about Kingdom Wins, not just your mission. This is one of the toughest things to do. I'll tell you that right now because you are focused on your job and your job is to get the resources you need in order to make sure your mission can go forward with what it does. So it is counterintuitive to talk about anything or anyone else other than what you do. The challenge is that that then leaves a whole lot of partners off the table that you could have. Uh, so I know at Water Street, one of the things we did is we would do shout outs to different ministries and organizations in the community that are also doing good things that had nothing to do with us. When we were doing that, we were doing two things. First, we were communicating to other organizations that we are team players, that we could work in events together, that we could uh, be part of projects together, and we weren't going to try and take away their, their uh, donors and or anything like that, that they knew that we were good team players. What it also does is, it once again, going back to that whole idea of posture, it communicates on a different level that we're secure. We're not, we're not presenting ourselves as a needy organization that we're talking about ourselves all the time. And also understand that like, there's, there's two aspects of this. First, there's like uh, the expertise aspect. Reality is that in a mission, you've got certain expertise towards poverty and homelessness. Uh, by having other people that you feature that talk about poverty and homelessness other than yourself, that shows a level of maturity that you're bringing people to them in order to be able to, to, to get a message to them. It's, it's a prime example right now. Brewer Direct, who has every bit as much expertise and beyond that I have in the area of marketing, is having me talk to you about this particular aspect of marketing, and that's community, uh, community building. That takes maturity on their part. But guess what? Because of that, they're doing exactly what Oprah did. Oprah had no necessarily like skill or expertise in of herself. What was Oprah's great claim to fame? She loved an audience of people and brought other people to them that could serve them. And so by, by being that human browser for your community, that if you have people that are interested in poverty and homelessness and helping alleviate those things or eradicating those things, that you become the one-stop shop because you're bringing other people and other information to them. There's also the whole party aspect of the whole thing. I've been to parties, that, big parties, organized by this person. I went and I did not talk to that host probably more than a couple minutes that whole evening, just saying hi and also saying thank you at the end before I left. And yet, I walked away saying, wow, that was a great host. Why? It was because of all the other people I was connecting with. And you want to know one of the, the huge keys of community building? It's when your community starts talking to each other and your community starts recognizing that, wow, I like being around these other people that like me are, are all about helping people that are going through poverty and homelessness. And so uh, by by recognizing that it's not just about your wins, but it's about kingdom wins, you can have that type of a pr approach. Uh, motivate through faith and inspiration and not fear and guilt. Um, reality is that, uh, that once again, we can use very manipulative ways to do things. I can tell you right now, faith and inspiration will always win. Recognize that in the end, people are motivated by one of two things. It's either avoiding pain or gaining pleasure. 
whether that's me coming to Christ because we loved him because he first loved us, or whether that's me coming to Christ because I don't want to go to hell. Uh, either way, it's a it's a avoidance of one or a gaining of the other. Recognizing that and speaking to everybody's better sides, uh, the, the spirit side of things is going to work so much better long term. Uh, next, connect the giver to the receiver, not the organization. When I was at Water Street, that was one of the very first things that I changed was we never talked about giving to Water Street. All the calls to action, everything else we did always revolved around giving to the people that we serve. Uh, giving to people like Jeff, giving to, it was always about our individuals that we serve or giving to help the community because we're eradicating this problem. It was always about who we were serving and how we were serving, not necessarily about us. Because the reality is no one wants to give to an organization. No one just wants to give money to a group of people with an executive director and all these different staffs and things like that. They want to know that when they give the that they're doing something for an individual. So the more you connect with that and how you speak to people, the better. Um, connect, excuse me, make your values come to life through stories. Uh, stories are hugely important. Christ could have just as easily told us from the beginning that, you know, love your neighbor. Left it at that. Okay. Maybe push it a little bit further and say instead, okay, this is how you love your neighbor. You love your neighbor because uh, if it's your neighbor is someone that you are coming alongside in life, it doesn't necessarily have to be the person that lives next to you. And anytime they're in need, you need to help them. Well, that would have been a great preaching at us type of a thing. And would it have, uh, would it have been true? Absolutely. No, instead he uses a parable. He uses a parable to tell us, to show us what a neighbor truly is so we can envision those people in our lives that we're coming alongside that may have an issue. He's telling us that story so that we can relate to the different people that responded to the Samaritan in different ways. He used stories. We need to use stories, not just like the turnaround stories are awesome, but how about the story behind, uh, behind a renovation that you did and why you did it at, at your mission? Why not... Uh, a story around uh, the great new recipe that uh, that one of your cooks in in your dining hall came up with and what inspired it from her childhood and how she wanted to bring that same feeling to the people at the mission. Those are stories that connect with people. Emotions connect. Um, next, employ messages that engage telos, pathos, logos, and ethos. Telos is the end goal or purpose. What's your what the big thing you're aiming toward is. Uh, pathos are the emotions involved. Uh, logos is reason, it, that's, it comes from logic. Uh, and ethos is character and morality. And those are things that it's, it's really tough to do. And I'm not saying that it has to be in every single communication you get all those things in. Sometimes it's just a matter of looking and saying, are we balancing out enough of these things? So like a, a logos type of, of thing might be a fact a fact about the level of homelessness in your area, a fact about how uh, how the economy has now affected the homeless in your area. Those are fact-based types of things that appeal to reason. Other things might be more emotional where it's purely just a story about how, hey, this person uh, had their, their child at the mission and it was the, the child said this was the first time they ever felt truly loved. Those types of things. It's not saying it has to be in a singular communication but you do have to make sure you're employing all those types of triggers for people. Um, I'm gonna ask that we, we play a video now. It's a little bit of a long video, but I think you'll get the idea when you talk, when you see the Telos, Pathos, Logos, and Ethos, how they're all incorporated in this one video. The poverty rate in Lancaster is 6.7% higher than in Philadelphia and 25% higher than in Pittsburgh. 40% of individuals in Lancaster County who become homeless have jobs. 70% of those living in poverty in Lancaster County if are want, located outside if, if of the city. you want to just post it in... Children under 18 comprise 17% of Lancaster's population, but make up 40.9% of those living in poverty. Numbers. Numbers help us design things, describe things, and explain things. Numbers can help us understand situations and set goals for progress. Some numbers can be encouraging, while others can feel daunting. 
But at Water Street, there's one number that means more than any other. As an individual, it's hard to find help. Some organizations will help the whole crowd instead of an individual. And the mission looks at the individual, not a whole crowd. We can examine numbers of those experiencing poverty or homelessness in Lancaster and calculate how much food and shelter is needed. We can measure the short and long-term impact of our programs. But to have the heart of Christ for people and provide an environment of hope, healing, and true restoration, Water Street Mission focuses on every individual we serve. They help teach you, they give you the tools to know who you are as a person. I'm in open arms, they're caring, they're loving, and they're just a group of great people here. Well, they talk to me, they listen to me, they hear me cry. There comes a point where they recognize that this person really does care about me and I can trust them. And it's that moment relationally when trust begins to be ex extended that I think that's the starting point of the turn. I never thought that staff could be my friends. And I have more than one staff person on board here that I am very close to and can call my friend. Poverty and homelessness are the obvious universal challenges that our guests face. However, we work with them to uncover and deal with their individual core issues and provide programs and services to address all dimensions of health. This creates a firm foundation on which to build a better and sustainable new life. Just reading the word and being around people that care for you, you learn how to rethink. I'm just not as like angry you know, don't get as mad like I used to get. I just think it calm and all that. I think about you know my actions and all that before I react. Came to the mission after eight years and now I have a year so. I believe that had I not got a place to stay that I would have died on the streets of Lancaster and I believe that. God is always in the picture and it helps you to learn about yourself in all the different classes. And I've actually been able for myself find out things that I've done wrong or have thought wrong in my past. I was sad, I was depressed, I, I was weak. I didn't believe anybody could help me. This place has turned me around completely. There are many who need love and a hand up. We can't possibly help them all by ourselves. That's why we're thankful for other organizations and ministries in our community that work alongside us to serve Lancaster's most vulnerable men, women, and children. And of course, we're thankful for the churches, businesses, and individuals who pray for us, volunteer with us, and partner with us financially. The Water Street Rescue Mission really addresses the problems of people who have problems. The poverty that you see in the city and the poverty that you see in the suburbs looks different, but um, the brokenness and the need for Jesus is universal. There's really no other explanation other than the love for people through Christ and the community. You know, in this city, you can't, no church can do it on their own. Water Street's been here for a long time and they've been faithful. And a ministry that's been around that long, you know is good ground. I don't know, I don't know that I can imagine uh, what would need to happen if Water Street didn't exist and how we would need to come together to try to fill the gap that they actually fill, uh, not only in a token way, but in an extraordinary way. By partnering with Water Street, you're not just helping the poverty-stricken and homeless population of Lancaster County. You're helping Arden, Don, Jefferson, and so many others. You're providing a hand up and a proven path to restoration so that they too can be restorers of others. I want to study for um, pastoral ministry, you know, and seek that, not, not give up, just, just push myself to do whatever I got to do, you know, and see where God leads me after that. <laughs> so that's, that's my goal. And I just want to help people. I want to help people overcome 
their situation and tell them that God loves us. He does. But we have to make the decision of choosing Christ as our Savior. We have to make that step. God can use me, man. I believe that's what God is calling me to do, is to, to minister in some way, because I'm living proof it's never too late. I'm Don Groff, and I am Water Street. I am Water Street. I am Water Street. I am Water Street. And I'm Water Street. And I am Water Street. And I am Water Street. And I'm Water Street. I am Water Street. And I am Water Street. God brought this ministry to where it's at today because I think it is part of his plan for his children to care for those who are hurting. He's brought about this connection of people from so many different churches and so many different communities and backgrounds to say, we're all in this together. How do we come together and create a place and an array of services and even more importantly, an array of relationships that can support people at the worst time of their lives? So clearly that was such a long video. I would never actually just post that online, but where it was very effective was using that uh, in situations like this, we've got a captive audience. It was it would actually be brought out by uh, some of the donor officers as they would meet with donors. And it was shown in situations like in churches and stuff when they were trying to get an introduction to what we do. It's an overall branding video, but we made sure because of it's a one clear total communication that it got all all the different parts and pieces in it that we just talked about. Uh, and clearly, if you get the mayor saying that I am Water Street, you've done something pretty okay. Um, so I talked a lot, so I'm gonna have to really kind of cherry pick a couple different things so we can get right to uh, question and answer. First, serve your partners. Uh, that includes media people. Most people feel like a reporter or someone at the newspaper owes it to you to cover your story at the mission uh, or other organizations. That's just not the case. You have to remember they're serving their audience and the more you can serve that media person by giving them the types of things that they need and want and not the types of things that they don't, the better they're gonna work on your behalf. Uh, next, remember businesses are run by people. They are not walking checkbooks for you. Uh, messages should be scaled, duplicated and repeated. Just because you posted something once on Facebook does not mean that everybody in the world has seen it. Um, so repeating things and taking like a brand message video like that, or we've also got a case uh, for support that's a big brochure type of format, taking parts and pieces of, the, of those and using them repeatedly all over the place so that people consistently get your message as that you have to do that. Uh, and be prayerful and try things. Uh, you're not going to break anything. You just need to try some stuff, test small and roll big. So don't start with a big a big free event if you've never done that before and you don't know if your audience is really ready for that instead try something small and if it feels like yes that you, you've got some good relationships going out of that then you can work a little bit larger um, as far as the engagement process i have it outlined here the one area i'm going to kind of zero in on quickly is on the discovery and inventory side of things list out your audiences most groups never do this they never put who are the people we're talking to we've got employees guests donors volunteers, media, community. We might even have uh, community leaders like uh, mayor's office and, uh, and school boards and things like that. All those different types of people you talk to, write those down because that's gonna help you in making sure that when you craft communications, you're hitting those different groups. Also, identify key influencers and uh, create personal uh, personas and avatars. These are like descriptions of your donors by groups. So I know that at Water Street, we had those that were retired widows. We had others that uh, were retired couples. We have some that are the up and comers, you know, young professionals, different groups of people. By, by categorizing them and creating these personas or avatars, it helps when you're communicating to make sure you're getting messages that are important to each one of those. Once again, that ties right back to the principle of people doing things for their reasons. Well, different groups of people have different reasons for why they do things. We are not gonna be able to get to the rest of it and have a Q and A time. So why don't we go ahead and, and go to Q and A. Maybe if you're interested in some of these bonus ideas, I can get those in uh, during that time. Um, thank you. That was 
wonderfully engaging material. I've been scratching down notes madly. Um, I want to remind you all that in the chat, there's a download for you to grab and go. If you haven't already gotten it, please do. It's There's some notes there from Tom. Um, we can also, you know, maybe Tom, you could put your contact information in that chat in case somebody wants to reach out to you right away directly. Um, thank you also for your endorsement of BDI. That was extremely generous. <laughs> thank you for that. We have some questions for you, and we're gonna go. We're gonna stay on this call to get as many as we can. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. So, ready, Tom? Are you ready? First question. Absolutely. Wait, wait, wait. Talk more about those avatars. Okay. So, <laughs> avatars. Uh, so, for instance, I at Water Street, one of the avatars uh, I had was philanthropic Phil. Philanthropic Phil was a uh, professional, and he uh, gave because he wanted to see the community as a whole improve. Uh, he had a wife and three kids. Now, are these real people? No, they're not. What you're doing is you're taking people that, if you looked at that group, this would be kind of like, you could see this as being like the, the average mix of those. It's the same type of thing when, when people create sitcoms and they try and figure out, okay, what type of family are we speaking to? We want the family to resemble that. So in a situation that was was philanthropic Phil. He, he had not only uh, different types of income level than others, but he also had a particular motivation towards community development. Uh, whereas we also had uh, one that I call Dutiful Dave. Dutiful Dave, had a business, uh, it was a landscaping company that had been handed down to him. He'd been working in the community for years, uh, has a very uh, heartland attitude. I mean, he, if, he, if it was a, a Coke Americana type of person with a pickup truck, that was Dutiful Dave. And he gave uh, uh, primarily because it was the thing to do. That's, that's how he was raised to be, you give. And so that's why he did it. Um, so just e even in having names for your avatars that are a little bit different, it helps you remember. It's not, it helps you remember as you're writing things that you've got different people you're talking to. Uh, as you're communicating with people, it's helping you recognize that, that they each have their own motivations. Did, did that answer the question okay? Here we go. That sounds fantastic. Thank you for that. Okay, question number two. Do you have uh, one to two easy to implement recommendations on how ministries can best disciple donors? I think part of it is just if you have the attitude of discipleship, if you know that this is what you're doing, it changes how you do what you're already doing. So you're already putting out uh, uh, emails. You're already uh, probably sending out a newsletter of some sort, whether it's hard copy or email. Just knowing that you are discipling, it changes it from a, a, a get type of attitude to a uh, language of finding joy in what they're doing. So uh, another way of doing it as well is definitely you want to feature other donors. So people do things for emulation purposes as well. Um, we all succumb to positive peer pressure and that's an awesome thing so one great way of discipling people is showing someone who has already found the joy of giving like show that volunteer who even though they could be retired on the beach uh you know if they wanted to they're there like once a week helping out in the kitchen and talk to them and get a quote from them about the joy that they find in what they do or why they do what they do and and be able to, to talk about those things and post it. If you've got someone who's donated, highlight those people, the ones that donate that, that get it. Because I guarantee you in, in your groups, you do have someone that is giving for all the right reasons and because they are totally like, they are just sold out uh, uh, and they're like mature Christian and they're doing things for the right reasons just feature those people. That helps that the whole discipleship incredibly well. Wonderful, thank you. Can you share some outreach tips for connecting with local media? Okay, this is the tough part for people who are not extroverts, and that is contact them. That the reality is you have to first put together a list. Not very difficult to do right now with, with uh, Google searches, you can find out uh, who the reporters are, and you don't just want to go to the general editor for the most part. Look at the actual like newspapers. Who has covered stories like that in the past? Like who has covered things relating to 
either it, it may be your religion editor, but there's also editors that typically tend to put pieces that have to do with either positives or negatives relating to homelessness and poverty. You want to find those reporters and you want to reach out to them and say, I don't have anything now, but I wanted to establish a relationship with you. The big principle with media is always dig the well before you're thirsty. Uh, most people, the problem is they tend to have a situation where, oh, I've got this event coming up. It's coming up in three weeks. I'm going to call the reporter and say they need to talk about my event. That's not how it works. Uh, it works by establishing relationship up front and finding out, like asking them. Biggest thing you can do, like in, in sales, it's a great thing. You ask someone what they would buy and then you sell them what they would buy. It's the same thing with media. The reality is if you ask the reporter, you make a contact, it can be it, it can be via email. Better is usually voicemail for the most part. They actually do, they typically like everyone else, they don't necessarily answer their phone for a number they don't understand or know, but they will typically listen to it. Definitely emails work uh, as well. But then ask them, once you make that, uh, uh, once you establish some sort of connection, ask them. What are the stories you like to run? What are the things that your readers most want to see? What are the, the things that that I can bring you proactively uh, if, if I hear something going on or I see something going on? How can I be your bird dog, basically? Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it makes you a person of value. You want to really up the game. When you hear them say something like that and you hear another story or another thing that has nothing to do with you, connect them. And at that point, they will be yours for life. Believe me, it was a great position we were in at Water Street because if we had one of those situations where either a guest uh, passed away prematurely uh, or uh, someone got in trouble for doing something or we were being accused of something by a former guest or anything like that, the reporter would typically call me first and say, Tom, this is what I'm hearing. Is this true? What's going on there? You know. You only have that type of privilege if you've established relationship with someone. If not, they're going to run the most salacious thing they can run because that's a reporter's mind typically is, is going down the path of hunting for the bad to show the world because they're crusaders. So you just have to know that about them. Great stuff. Great answer. Incredible. Number four. Okay. Fourth question. I loved what you said about influencing and leading. Influencers are a forefront in product marketing and advertising today. How do we apply that culture and strategy to our organizations? How can we become influencers in our communities? Okay, so first there's two aspects of the influencer side. First, there's harnessing the influencers you already have that are that are working on your behalf. So I can guarantee you in your donor ranks, in your, uh, in your, uh, volunteer ranks, you've got people who are influencers. And guess what? They don't always have to be the big money people. Uh, the reality is that you could have someone that volunteers with you that's the, the mother of the president of a particular company in your, your area. So influence is not just about the people that we see as influencers. But first, try and identify those influencers and, and help elevate them and empower them to share you with others. The other side of it is, if you want to be influential, you do think, I mean, this is a base rule of influence. Doing things for someone else with no expectation of anything in return will make you a person or an organization of influence. So if your organization wants to have greater influence in your community, do something for your community or do things like talk about those who are doing things in your community, but it's not you, start doing those types of things and people will see you as an influencer because they'll recognize that you are, you're doing everything you can with what you've got. You've got a, you've got your own bully pulpit of people who listen to you now. So for you to talk about, Hey, we just saw that so-and-so uh, sponsored this event for, for hope international or some other like big organization. And it's not you. And we're just like, we applaud when businesses uh, take the forefront in leading like that. Boom, done. Leave it at that. There is no hook. There's no ask. There's no anything. And by doing those types of things repeatedly, people start to see that as your character and you will raise your influence. That's awesome. Awesome. Can you give us a favorite example of motivating through faith and inspiration? Um, let's see. 
Motivating through faith and inspiration. Well, it's, I think the video did kind of touch on some of that um, as far as that very much was a faith filled message. I think the big thing is if you're talking about where you're going and what you're doing, that's inspirational versus it's really kind of a, 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 a contrast. It's what it's not is talking about the need from a standpoint of lack. It's not talking about a need from the standpoint of we've got a thousand mouths to feed and we need 200 more meals to be able to feed them. That's a, a demotivating and lack based message. Instead, when you're talking about the community and you're talking about getting money for food, we want to be able to supply this many more for these people. Uh, we, we have all these, these, these wonderful people in our community who right now don't have any place to go. We want to be that place and we want you along with us to help them have that place. That's a faith message. Uh, it's still asking for the same thing. And is there still a real lack? Yes. It's just not giving voice to the lack. It's giving voice to the vision. And that's, to me, the faith side. Right. We don't, we don't live in an economy of scarcity. We, no. live in, we have an abundant God, right? And we're just, I mean, what we say at PDI is we're releasing that generosity. It's there. That's exciting. Okay, so you talked about how you use avatars to identify donors. How do you approach different stakeholder groups and build, uh, like, do you build different annual strategies to reach and engage with churches, for example, corporations, civic groups, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, so for churches, uh, we have an event, actually, that we do that's specifically for churches. It's, it's um, um uh, it, it's all about the churches working together. And it was like a really cool experience because we had a group of 140 uh, people that represented, I think it was 70 churches in the area that all came together to talk about how we can, how we can help our community better. It was not anything about Water Street. We weren't asking them to give anything to Water Street or anything like that. It was just, how can we help people that are living in poverty and, and homelessness in our area. How can we reach out to our neighbors better? Um, and so that's that was one strategy we used. Uh, we had something specifically for that group. And we also, Water Street was blessed in the way that we had a, a at least a part-time church ambassador who reached out to churches on a regular basis to see how can we help them uh, with educating in their communities of uh, you know what's happening in in our area, and it, we also that that also tended to be where we would coordinate uh, what they were able to do, whether it's financial or volunteer basis on an ongoing basis. Also, businesses businesses like we completely transformed how we were dealing with businesses because, like most organizations, they tend to treat businesses like just. Like it's a little league team that people sponsor, you know, that your mission is just like that little league team. And instead, we looked for all sorts of ways that we could, A, connect the businesses with each other. I mean, yeah. people love doing pe business with people that they know, like, and trust and that they have an affinity with. And so two organizations that both do stuff for Water Street, they have the same heart. Connect them. Help them do business with each other. Be, a, be an organization of influence there. But then additionally, look at your, and, and this gets into the, the first of the bonus ideas, I'm getting sponsors. Uh, it's look at your sponsorships and things like that as an opportunity to really bring value to them, not just list them on the back of a program. Reality is that uh, first, big hint there, first, when I call it the moving train, it's because I always gave away the first sponsorship free to a local media group in exchange for free media. What did I do by doing that? I created a moving train scenario. The, the, the first one on any event, first sponsorship is always the most difficult. To be able to go to the second sponsor and say, yes, WJTL is already on board. That made it so much easier. So by creating those, those things where good organizations were being recognized together, making sure to shout them out as much as we possibly could on Facebook, on the back ends of videos, 
on uh, a newsletter, anywhere we could possibly shout praises to what they were doing, the better. And guess what? When it came to Facebook, the posts that we would boost would always be ones that we got sponsorships. If, if someone like came and sponsored an event or like those people that we would have in our, uh, that would, would come with like large like bins of lettuce because they're local farmers and they had some excess they wanted to bring to us, those types of groups, we made sure to shout them out and promote that because by helping them see that we're, we're looking out for them and we want them to truly get value and to be seen for what they do, um, the hardest thing with some of them was getting them to actually let us use their name and to shout them out uh, because they're so humble. But I wanted them to recognize that, that, that we did want to create a positive peer pressure amongst others. But just by, by the group of businesses together, that was a huge strategy to make sure that we were, we were constantly shouting them out and connecting them to each other. That is an invaluable you know, tip for, for all of us, really, even as an agency, for our clients, uh, for those that are on the call. That's all the time we have for today. I'm so grateful for you, Tom, joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for all who have joined us on this webinar. Our next webinar will be held on July 20th. Write it down, put it in your calendars, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The topic will be key insights from Giving USA's 2020 Charitable Giving Report, brought to you by our own Rhonda Moore, Director, Director of Strategy at BDI. We look, look forward to seeing you there, and until then, Thank you again for joining us. Have an amazing and blessed day.